Uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, some familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, the arrival to sin on God's creation. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, in the very first verse. Now the serpent was more subtle, subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doeth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word. What a privilege and what an honor it is to have it in each and every day of our life, Lord, that we can simply open it up and it be right before us wherever we're at. God, we pray that you would honor your word this morning to the hearts of the hearers. God, open the, up the hearts of the lost that they may know you as Savior even this day. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning, the Lord being a uh, helper on the thought, don't believe everything you hear. Mm -hmm. Now, we live in a day and age where that's pretty much what people do. And if it's here on Facebook, all of a sudden it's gospel truth and people are, are scared and upset when we forget the basic principle of this sinful flesh, people lie. Yeah. People do not have your best interest at heart. Now they'll try to convince you of that, but that is a lie right out of the pits of hell. And we see that it's been that way really since the arrival of sin, the, the biggest sin is believing a deception. Believing that you're okay without Christ. Believing that salvation uh, sometime is, somehow is regeneration in water. All of those things are a lie. There, there is no truth in them whatsoever. And, and you know, I always look back to the Bereans. <laughs> Uh, uh, the Bereans, what does the Bible say about them? Uh, every day they look to see if it were so. That ought to be the heart of every Baptist church and every Christian in the whole world. Don't believe it because I said so. Measure it against that word. Yep. And apparently, most don't do that today. Right. Apparently, that is the exception, not the rule. And because of that, people uh, are falling headlong into heresy and some, no doubt, falling headlong into hell believing that they are A-OK. -okay. <laughs> so we see the arrival of sin. Now, the serpent was more subtle, a subtle than any beast of the field. Now, I want you to look at the description of the serpent. It says it's a beast, not a reptile. Now, I believe prior to the arrival of sin that the, the, the snake or the serpent was totally different in its presentation and its appearance fought prior to the fall. I believe Satan incarnated this beast, whatever it looked like, because it was attractive. Now, I don't know what pre-fall serpents were, but it's not the rattlesnakes that we see running around Stewart County every day because had it been, it wouldn't have been in the garden. The garden was a place of sinlessness. Uh, the garden was a place of virtue. The garden was a place where no harm could come. So it could not be the snake 
the serpent that we see it today. Prior to the fall, apparently he was a beautiful creature to look upon. Apparently he, he was noteworthy in the way that he looked. But then sin came on the scene. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman. Now another attribute that we see is he had the ability of conversation. Now the best we know, uh, there are no other beasts that have conversational skills that are significant with humans. Now, I've seen dolphins on TV, and supposedly they're, talk, uh, they're talking to dolphins, and dolphins are talking to them. And I think it's foolishness. You know what? My, that little puppy Donna ball, uh, it'll say sit, but it don't sit because it understands me. It sits because it's going to get a treat, right? And, and, and that's not a dog that understands language. That's a dog that's been trained. And, and so I want you to see prior to the fall, the, the, the creation was so much more spectacular that these, these beasts that are around us prior to the fall probably could talk just like you and I. And they could communicate uh, with, with God's man. And so we see that when this serpent, however it presented in those days, uh, began to talk to Eve, she was not alarmed. Now, probably prior to this event, the beast told the truth. I believe the lie came, the first lie came on this scene right here. Uh, remember, beasts tell the truth and beasts are attractive. You learn that lesson. If you don't get anything else out of this message this morning, you write that one down. Beast lie and beast are attractive. When we think of beast, we think of dinosaurs or, or, or we think of, you know, uh, some kind of uh, uh, a gorilla or something. No, no. Beast are attractive. He said, I can transform into an angel of light. And that, that, is, his, that is his ability. And so the serpent begins to have this discussion with Eve and he's going to He's going to tell the first lie. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, I want you to see first of all that Satan knows the law of God and knows the word of God better than you. Because there weren't but two, two there wasn't but one law in that day. There were two items they could not eat. Uh, and those were the trees in the midst or the middle of the garden, the, call it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of eternal life. Those two they weren't allowed to eat or take of or do anything with. And the serpent knew it. He said, now didn't he tell you that? Can, can you eat that? There never was a time and after this point where man didn't question God's word. That is the nature of man, to question exactly what the Word of God is really saying. You know what I will tell you with the King James Bible? Take it for what it says. If it's not speaking figuratively, assume that it's just like it reads. And, and you know, that's the modern day. We want to, we want to uh, say, well, everything, well, it's speaking in type. Well, unless it says, and he spake unto them a parable, you know what? It's real. It's true. It's exactly what it says it is. And, and so we see that uh, the, the devil was very knowledgeable of the word of God. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the, of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat it, not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, unless you die. Now, is that what was said? No. That was not the, what was said at all. Go back with me to Genesis 2 and verse 15. Genesis 2 and verse 15, this was the message of God. And the Lord God took the man 
and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded him, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So I want you to see it is uh, the object of Satan to add to the word of God. He doesn't necessarily want to obliterate it because it's, it's an in, instinct of man to, to want some God. They don't want the God of the Bible, but we want some relationship with a God. And so apparently, Adam didn't trust his wife. Adam did not think that she was able or probably more likely he didn't trust the Word of God. Do you trust the Word of God? I don't think that Adam did because Adam added to it. You can't eat it or touch it, Eve. Don't do either one. He lied to her, right? He added to the Word of God. He thought, well, if I add this little bit extra, she'll still steer clear. But she didn't. We do. You know what? Adding to the Word of God is just as evil as taking from the Word of God. And, and, and so we find that uh, she got some misinformation from her own husband, and it was going to be to their detriment. <coughs> uh, verse, uh, back to chapter 3, uh, verse 4, the biggest lie comes now. Adam's told a lie. Now the devil's going to tell a bigger one. And the, serpent, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now, uh, a half-truth is a lie, right? And, and so he knew that she was going to die that day in the flesh. And everybody since that time has a very much a time appointed. And when the time appointed arrives, you are going to die. And let me say, as a registered nurse, I know that to be true. I've seen a team of excellent physicians around the bed doing everything humanly possible, and they go right on out to eternity. See, uh, that, that, that is a stamp plate of the curse of the law, is we are going to die. And, and so, but that, that initial death is carnal. We, we're going to give this body up. We're going to die one day. We're going to be planted out in the lot beside the church. And that is the first death. But let me tell you, dear friend, the second death that the Bible speaks about is much more horrific than the first death. The second death, you will be cast alive into hell. Now, you can look back. We're not going to do it today because it's not in the message. But you go back. And, and you look at the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man, all his faculties was intact, even including his memory. Right. That's hell. That's the reality of hell. You think about the people that are there this morning and, and still remembering the times they heard gospel truth, yet still their nature is not changed. And so he lies to her. Verse 5. For God doeth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall be, your, eye, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, God has our, our best interest. He has us in mind. He has our betterment in mind with everything that he left us. Every word is for our benefit. The ones that feel good and the ones that hurt, they're all for our benefit. And so we apparently find the devil questioning that benefit. He's not helping you. He's limiting you. Right? Yeah. He, he, it's not to your betterment. It's, it, it's to your detriment. And then I want you to see the next time he says, as God's little g in your King James Bible, he begins to question the authority of God. 
There's more than one God. You can be a God on your own if you wish. And so he, he, he questions the position of God. That's one thing. You know, you know what will always lead to rebellion is you questioning God's position. Right. And questioning God's position. What does it say in John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when we question that, we're questioning God. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we see that as, as sin emerges, he appeals to her character. Now, I will insert this, and we'll move on. Satan's fall has already happened, or he would not be doing these right. things. Uh, he had already been cast into the earth, or this, in fact, would have been an impossibility. Uh, verse 6, and the woman saw, huh, you be very cautious of these eyes. These eyes are bent on evil. These eyes are continually carnal. We like to see things. And quite real, in, in the real reality, we like to reveal things. <laughs> you know, uh, the less clothes, the better. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the world's philosophy. Don't buy into that. And then those, they like to see it. And so her basing her decision, not on the word of God, but on what looked good, was the detriment to all mankind. Don't make your spiritual decisions on what you see. Because that will always be to your detriment. That will always be to your undoing as it was to Adam and Eve. And, now, uh, and when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. Now, a lot of people disagree with me. A lot, me and a lot of preachers have had long discussions on this, but I, unless the Bible says it's figurative, I don't assume it's figurative, and unless the Bible says something's missing or a time of span has occurred that the Bible refers to, then I assume the Bible speaks exactly as it is. And the best I under the context of that scripture, he was with her the whole time. Her husband with her. And he never said, Eve, be careful. Eve, let's get out of here. Eve, you know this is better than this is a mess we're about to get into. He never intervenes at all. That's a very poor husband. That is a very poor preacher. That is a very poor man. And she, he never does that. In fact, he takes him a big chomp too. And then the fall occurs, verse 7, and the eyes of both of them uh, were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and <coughs> made themselves aprons. Now, we won't get into that this morning, but I want you to see that part of the depravity of man, the way that the very first time it presented, their idea of clothing and man's idea of clothing was two different things right. from the very beginning. And, and, and so we see then that we are to believe everything we hear. You know what? This world today would have you on pins and needles and twisting your hands and, and all upset. And you know what? I can't say that I understand everything, but I trust God in everything. You know what? I don't know why there had to be a hurricane. I don't know why part of Florida had to be demolished, but I do know this. God was in control of it. Right. And it would be a bad, bad person in me to question why he did it. Instead of questioning why he did it, you've got some time when you can go down and help him. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we see from the beginning, God's plan should never, ever, ever be questioned. Right. Because that will always lead to sin. And so we see they heard something, and unfortunately, they believed it. Now go with me to 2 Kings. We find a little bit of a different situation. 
2 uh, Kings chapter 18. Uh, fairly familiar verses of scripture. Hezekiah got into a little bit of a mess. Uh, 2 Kings 18, and we'll begin reading in verse 22. Hezekiah, uh, I mean, excuse me, 2 Kings 18, beginning in verse 22. And if you know your Bible, you, you know this, that the great opposers had raised up against God's people. Do you know what's different now than I, when I was a boy? The people that hate God have increased in number. The people that are going to church have declined in number. That, that is the difference. But blessed be the name of the Lord, He's still on the throne. Not one, you know how many people wind up in church? Exactly the number that God wants to. Yeah. Right? If we believe He's sovereign, we have to believe it all, right? Uh, so don't get the boo-hoos and the twisted hands when six people show up because that was ordained of the Almighty. What he may be doing is uh, testing your faith. Not only your faith, but your faithfulness. And, and, and so we see then as the Lord's people that often we focus on the wrong things. So in this day, the enemy was growing and God's people were under duress. And we're going to pick up in verse 22. But if we say, but if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God. Now, I want you to see the, the thing here, this, the, this, this situation, a huge army of God's enemy uh, surrounding Jerusalem. And, said, and, and, and this was the lie. Don't you trust in your God. Don't you put your faith in him. It'll be to your undoing. And that's what they're saying today. Right. They're saying, listen, the, the, this is a bill of goods. Getting snatched out and going home to glory is a, is a fable. Don't you depend on your God. You better, you better buy into uh, you better buy into their plan or you're going to starve to death. You know what? That, that, that's a line right out of the pits of hell. Yeah. And, and, and so we see then that this was a situation and they were using that, the God's enemies were using that to their benefit. But if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, it's not that he whose high places and who altars and whose altars Hezekiah have taken away and have said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall not worship before this altar, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to see the scenario here because uh, uh, Hezekiah was getting rid of idolatry. He had taken down the, the altars to Baal, and he'd taken down the ones up in the groves where they worshiped green, evergreen trees, uh, and he had ripped them all out and said, if you want to worship, you go to Jerusalem and you worship the God of heaven. And he said, <laughs> these false people said, Hezekiah's messed you up. He, he, he's, he, 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 he's getting you on the wrong track. Yeah, you, you hear people say that? Oh, believe what you want to. You know, whatever feels good. Mm -hmm. There you go. Believe that. See, that doctrine has been around about as long as time. And so they were trying to turn God's people against God's man. Verse 23. Now, therefore, I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, meaning the king of Assyria, the king of Assyria, I will deliver thee 2,000 horses that thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. Now, give them a, a, a really big plan. Said, now, what I want you to do <laughs> in the modern day, and I, I'll give you a new truck for it. You worship me. You worship uh, the king of Assyria. You're going to come out a lot better in the long run. That is the message of today. You know why I'll probably live to see 
this country becomes socialistic because nobody wants to work and everybody wants a check. That's what, that's what he was promising them. I'll give you a horse for free. I, I, I'll, let you, I'll let you have exactly what you want. All you have to do is give up your God. Verse 24, how then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servant? In other words, how are you going to fight against these people and, and put thy trust on Egypt for the chariots and for the horsemen? And, and am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now I want you to see, just like the serpent, he says, the Lord's told me this. The Lord told me to come up here and do this to y'all. The Lord said it was okay. That's what it is today, is it not? Think of Nancy Pelosi. On the top of the Catholic, I mean, she's so Catholic, it falls off of her. But what she has is religion and she'll use it to her advantage. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And that's exactly what this fella, he, he knew those people uh, knew about Jehovah God. He said, well, I can, I can include that in my plan. Don't you believe everything that you, you know, he did not even know God any more than Nancy Pelosi does. But he threw the name around. Why? He knew they would believe, or he thought they would believe. Just throwing it around, telling them a lie. Tell them it's okay. Uh, tell them, if you don't trust me, you're gonna be in a big mess because your God told me come, to come and destroy Jerusalem. Verse 25, excuse me, verse 26. Then said Ella, Ella Achim, the son of Helkiah and Shebna and Joah and Rabbi Shanaka, speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. Talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. So what they were asking, you speak in a language they don't understand, that way we know they won't know what you're saying. When me and Donna get around Amish people, and you know, uh, or maybe I'm just seeing it myself, and I'm and I tell them, you better get to the hospital. And they start their Pennsylvania Dutch, and I don't know if they're supporting me or making fun of me. Right? That's what he wanted to do. You talk in a language they can't understand, and then we'll proceed with this thing. You know. You know what the world wants you to do? They don't want you to mention the God of the Bible. Speaking, you know what? People can lie to you a whole lot better when you don't even understand what they're saying. And that's exactly what their plan was. We can, uh, we can, uh, we, we can speak in this language. They won't even know what we're saying and they'll believe us anyway. But Rab Shaka, verse 27, said unto them, Hath my master sent me to, to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Have he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rab Shaka stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake and said, Hear the word of the great king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us, and this king shall be, and this sh city shall be delivered uh, into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by present and come out to me and then eat ye of every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree and, de and drink ye every one the waters of the cistern. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. The invitation was not to believe God's man. Don't you believe that preaching? 
we're going to take you down. Now, if you remember, they're in Jerusalem and they're inside the city and it's locked up all around them. That's when a mule's head went for 50 pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. There was nothing left to eat. There was nothing left to drink. He said, you agree with us? Don't you believe that's a time? And you'll get to eat again. You'll get to drink again. Now, I think the beverage they offer is very interesting. You drink out of a cistern. Now, has anybody ever drink out of a cistern but me? Yeah. It's nasty. It is really, uh, it's stale. My, my mother used to call it stale water. And pretty much that's what it is. That's not much of an invitation, but listen, when you're thirsty, you'll take it. Mm -hmm. You know, God's people today, I found this, are thirsty for the Word of God. Why do they believe that stupid stuff? They're drinking water from a sister instead of a well. Yeah. And when you're thirsty, <laughs> any water tastes good. I can't remember which one of my boys, I think it was Adam, saying the other day that they was on the back of the land got lost, as they did many times. And they found some kind of pool of water, and it was brown, and they said, thirsty, they drank out of it. <laughs> Lord only knows what they drink. But you do a lot of dumb stuff when you're thirsty, won't you? They wasn't really offering much. And you know what? The devil's offer may seem good, but I will guarantee you he's not offering much. Uh, he's not offering you much. And, and so... You know the rest of the story, and we're not going to read it for time's sake, but uh, remember old Hezekiah? He went down to the temple, and he took all that. They had sent him an edict and, and, and told him line by line, this is what we're going to do. We're going to knock your walls down. We're going to take your life. We're going to destroy your people. And he took that whole document, and he laid it out before the Lord. And he said, I do us know. <laughs> he didn't believe a word the enemy said. I do as you know that thou can deliver us. And you know what? God did. <laughs> he didn't believe him. Uh, he didn't believe the, the enemy. And, and they were they were wholly delivered on the merit of God. Believe God. This world's message, it's not, you know, we, we don't be so ignorant to believe the message of this world is going to be disgusting. It's going to be extremely appealing. It's going to be really, really nice. We're going to fix you up. We're going to, we're going to make things good for you again. Remember, remember President Biden's uh, campaign slogan a few years back, Build Back Better, Sounds good, don't it? Now, he didn't come through with us, did he? But it sounds good. And so we see that in, in, the, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of what sounds to be a good offer, remember God has your best interest at heart. And that's exactly huh, what we the people, uh, we, we the Lord's people need to do. Now, go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Uh, very familiar verse of Scripture. I think sometimes it's taken out of context, but it is a very familiar verse of Scripture. Uh, John, chapter 3, but we're going to begin reading in the verse. The first verse, there was a man of the Pharisees, verse, first verse, John 3, first verse, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now, I want you to see uh, Nicodemus is fixing to get the truth for the first time. He'd been a good, good Jew. But he was about to get the truth. And the truth was this, how useless he really was. Now, how ungodly he really was. Also, I want you to see, he, he shows his card. You can watch people. You can't judge, but you can, you can watch people know what's going on. He came by night. 
You know why he did that? He didn't want to be embarrassed. He, he didn't want to know the, he didn't want the synagogue buddies to know that he even knew Jesus. And so he came by night, came, came in the shadow of night. Nobody's going to watch me go down there. I'll be fine. I just want to, I want to kind of check this guy out. And that's what he does. Jesus, very simple message. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now that's some truth. That's someone not shooting you a bill of goods. That's someone that loves you and is interested in you, that is giving you the truth right down the line. And what is this truth? It's an impossibility in man's eyes. He says, well, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. He's like, what? You know, that's the lost person's spiritual knowledge. Is, what are you talking about? Can I be born again? And he goes on to the deep discourse. And he says, you got to be born of water and the blood. Now, Church Christ people start being really brave. Woo! Water, water, water. Water, water everywhere. But he's talking about the carnal birth. When a baby's inside its mama, it's encapsulated in water. He says you've got to be born that way. You have to be a person. And then it says you must be born of the Spirit, capital S Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, a second birth, a new birth that he was trying to tell Nicodemus about. You must be born of the Spirit. Oh, what a rich truth. What a wonderful truth. Jesus will not sell you a bill of goods. He will always tell you the truth. He'll tell you how wretched and ungodly you are, mm -hmm. and he'll tell you how he's the answer for all. He will tell you the truth. You know what? <laughs> He'll tell you when you've made a false profession, too. <laughs> That's the goodness of our God. That's the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, the first birth. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth or where it wishes to. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So I want you to see, he gives us an in look into the Holy Ghost. Now, the best I understand, if I understand the Word of God at all, the Holy Ghost had not moved on the scene yet. Because remember, one of his last addresses to his church, I think it is in... Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 13. He said, I'll send you a comforter, which is the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But he gives some lightning of this and says, you got to be born of the Spirit. Who did the work to bring you into this place? Your parents. You, you had no contribution to that. You didn't ask, Lord, you know, parents, can I be born? That's foolish. We all know that's foolish, right? Then how do we think it's okay to request to be begotten of God? It's foolish. It's exactly what it is. It's a foolish thought. Like, oh, what a rich, wonderful blessing. He'll, <laughs> he initiates it. He call, call. You think about when the Lord saved you. When the Lord saved me, I had no idea what predestination or election or any of those rich truths were. I just knew I was a helpless sinner in need of redemption. That's the only thing I knew. And you know what? By His mercy and grace, He saved me. We, we need to understand that. Whatever Jesus tells us in his word of God, 
It is for our betterment. Verse 14, drop down to there. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, if you know what he's referring back to, uh, they were in rebellion against Moses, and he sent serpents among them, and many of them that were dying, and they needed, they needed a solution. They needed some help. And, and, and so he says, Moses, you do this for them. You make you a brazen serpent, a serpent created out of brass, and you raise it up on a high pole, and everyone that looks on it shall live. Now, I want you to see that, uh, was that serpent real? Hmm. Brazen serpent. You know what the Bible says concerning Christ? He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He did not bear any sin at all. It was like he was made just like the serpent. He looked like that, that brazen serpent, looked at the serpent, but it was the serpent. Christ looked like a man, behaved like a man, had the, kind of, had the, had, had the uh, faculties of a man, but he was all God at the same time. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You look unto him. Whatever he tells you, you may depend upon. Verse 15, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. So simple, so easy. We complicate it these days. But listen, you don't have to be a five-pointer. Let me point you unto Christ. You just believe in Him this morning. You, He is your remedy for sin. He taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a rich truth. Much, much better than what the serpent told Eve, much better than what those dominions of hell told Hezekiah that he was going down. You can depend on what Christ has to say. That's a rich truth. That, that's something that you can, you can take to the grave with you and, and, and rejoice as you're on your way there is that this word of Christ is true. Now I want to go to one more place in 1 Corinthians. Now if you know the Corinthian letter, 1 Corinthians 15, the very last chapter, if you know Corinthians very well, it was a a church that had lots and lots and lots of problems. It was a Greek church. Very few or no Jews. And they had problems like this in the church. When you should be on meat, you're still on milk. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you be concerned if, uh, if AJ back there was still on the bottle? I'd be worried to death about him, wouldn't you? But we don't get concerned. People have been saved 30 years, and they're just, they're just, you know, no development at all. And we're like, well, that's how it is. No, no, no. We need to be concerned about them. We need to talk to them. We need to present things to them. Uh, and uh, they had that problem, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. They had a man shacked up in a relationship with his stepmother, and the church was not addressing it. Shame on the church of Corinth. He said, you need to deal with this. He said, in fact, he says, when you come together, when you meet the next time, you take care of this problem. Right. And the best we know, they did. And you know, a letter like that or a, a sermon like that can, can kind of make you feel down a little bit, but kind of make you feel like, well, uh, I don't know what to do next. But listen how he ended this letter. Almost the last of the letter, he encourages this church greatly, the very Word of God, things that you can depend upon. 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to begin reading in verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy. That's the natural man, that's the flesh without Christ. The second man is the Lord from heaven. 
As it is, the earthy, such are, uh, such are they also that are earthy, and, and as is in heavenly, they which are also that are heavenly. Now, in verse 48, we get a good glimpse of what the redeemed look like. Earthy people, all they think about is the here and the now and how they can fit in and how they can look good and the things they can do to make themselves feel good. You know what they are? They're earthy. They're earthy. And I have very little confidence in their... And, you know, instead of saying I have little confidence in their, in, in their regeneration, what I should be scared to death for. Right. Praying for them the best I know how. Because they're in a dangerous spot. They're in a, a difficult place. And so we, as the Lord's people, we've seen that among God's people. Verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, what rich, wonderful news, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. He said, the Lord said in his own ministry that we have new bodies, that, that, that we would be in the likeness of the Son of God. He, he said there would be never, neither male nor female. We, we would have something brand new, like an uneven to Christ. And he reminds them of that. When, when they were so mixed up in the world and they were, they, 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 they were being brought down as a church people, he says, you remember this. You've got better things coming. That's something you can depend on. Better things are on their way. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now we all get a little anxious and a little nervous about death and when it's coming our way, but let me say this. Listen, you need to get rid of this stuff. If you're going to be by Christ, this is going to be changed or you got to put it aside, one of the two. And listen, oh, that's good news. That's something you can depend on. That's when you can look on the dying, and if they're saved, be encouraged. They're, they're just putting this off. They're just done with it. And what, what, a, rich, what a rich, wonderful blessing that, that we can depend, those of the redeemed, that there is something more when we live, leave here. So, verse 54, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal have should put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful rich truth that we can depend on every day. Death ended, swallowed up in victory. Now, after all the redeemed and we're home, death will not occur no more. But here, this has not happened. There are lots and lots of other people like us yet to be saved some 1,900 years later. And you know what? There's been a whole, whole, whole lot of redeemed died between then and now, has it not? You know what that was? That was a victorious death. That was a wonderful death. Mm -hmm. they, they, they died standing for the truth. <laughs> Fox's Book of Martyrs I, I recommend you read it person after person after person that <laughs> refused to deny Christ in the face of death you know what they did they, they died victoriously look at Stephen Acts chapter 7 was he wringing his hands hey Lord last thing he said Lord lay not this sin to their charge that's dying victoriously. He said, for the redeemed, he promised that. He said, you're going you're gonna to die in victory. Don't be fearful of death. Don't be troubled about, de about death. What a wonderful, wonderful truth. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who give us up, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it a wonderful thing that it don't depend on you this morning? The victory is through Christ. Mm -hmm. Do you trust Him? Do you know Him? 
Has he manifested himself to you? It's incredibly important this morning, is it not? Right. It's all there is.